Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see you all and to welcome you to today's Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and of wonder to change our world. The very heart of the National Geographic community is of course our National Geographic Explorers. Nat Geo Explorers are cutting edge scientists, amazing researchers, groundbreaking storytellers, adventurers, filmmakers, photographers, all kinds of cool stuff. And these Explorer Classroom events connect students around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. We're now hosting Explorer Classroom every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, in addition to all of our usual events. So if you'd like, I can see you right back here on Monday at the same time. But for today, we're very, very lucky to be connecting with Jonathan Giddens. Jonathan is an ocean ecologist and the chief scientist for National Geographic Exploration Technology Lab's Deep Sea Research Project. Today, we're gonna to learn all about the Global Deep Sea Research Project and how Jonathan and her team are using art to inform and enrich their expeditions. But before we get to that, I would like to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by several student groups today, and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more of you watching from all around the world. Welcome, folks. Today, our students are representing Alabama, Arizona, California, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Idaho, Illinois, Kentucky, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Maryland, Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, Nebraska, New Hampshire, New Jersey, uh, New York, Oklahoma, Ohio, Oregon, Puerto Rico, South Carolina, Texas, Virginia, Washington, Wisconsin, Wyoming, Canada, Croatia, Germany, Hungary, Indonesia, Italy, Malaysia, Peru, Romania, Singapore, South Africa, Ukraine, and the United Kingdom. I have a couple of special shout outs to give today. We've got the A family, Addison, Andrew, Annabelle and Gareth, Aya, Becky, Chloe, Connor, Davis, Elizabeth, Felicia, Hadley, Jaden, Kate H, Kira and Steven, Lucas, Maxwell, Miles, Mitchell, Russell and their mom, Erica, Miss Hagen's room 37, Mrs. Kimball's class, Miss Cumin's fourth graders, uh, the fifth graders from Miss Cernil's class, Nyan, Nora, Christian, Sonia, Zoe, that's a lot of you, but there's almost a thousand of you registered to watch, so I'm sure I missed someone. Go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat bar if I've missed you, we'd love to say hi. Um, but we know it's not just students out there watching, there's also tons of wonderful teachers out there. And this week on Explorer Classroom, we're taking an extra moment to show our appreciation for teachers around the globe. Your work has never been more important and it's never been more apparent. So this Teacher Appreciation Week, we're here to say that we see you and to say thank you for all that you do for your students, your fellow educators, and for your communities each and every day. So from everyone at the National Geographic Society, thank you to our teachers. And with that, it's now time to turn it over to Jonathan for today's Explore Classroom lesson. Wow, that is amazing. Thank you so much for the introduction, Celeste, and thank you all for joining today. I'm so excited to share about the work that we're doing at National Geographic um, Exploration Technology Lab, exploring the deep sea and providing the science needed to be able to protect our oceans. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. I have a few slides to show with you. Um, let's see if I can get the right one. All right, can everybody see the screen? Okay, good. Great, yep. Okay, so I'll begin. So this talk is about um, the science and art of deep ocean exploration. So the work that we're doing with National Geographic Exploration Technology Lab. And it's, um, so I'll share with you the, the exploration that we're doing as well as the artistic approach that we bring to, the, to this exploration to be able to share the work more broadly. Uh oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> my computer was haunted again. So just before delving into the science that we do, I wanted to just give a feeling of the ocean because this is what really drives my work. It's what made me want to become a marine ecologist in the first place. It's because when I first met the ocean when I was young, it's one of my first memories. I was just overwhelmed with awe and wonder. 
and inspiration to see such a great body of water and this great magnificent um, aspect of our planet. It made me feel like I was a part of something really special, that this earth is really special and that being a human being on this planet um, is a, just such a wonderful place to be. And so that feeling of, of the ocean, um, every time I, I don't even have to go there, I can just think of it. And it makes me feel at home. It makes me feel calm and grounded. And I think that that is a really important um, tool to be able to have to just picture the ocean and imagine the feeling of the ocean and this great body of water and, and our wonderful planet to help us feel calm and connected and uh, a part of something wonderful. So especially in these uncertain times, these last few months have been very difficult for a lot of us. And I always draw on that feeling of the ocean. So that's something that I wanna um, share with you today is something about that feeling and to let you know that no matter where you are, everybody is connected to the ocean in the air that we breathe um, in, in so many aspects, even just noticing how water is a part of our everyday life. Um, so you can always go back to that feeling of an imagination of the ocean to feel um, inspired and connected and at home. So that's kind of where I came from and what drives my work every day is to um, connect and to share that feeling of the ocean and realize how important it is for life on our planet. So our planet is mostly water. Um, as are we, we're, our bodies are made up of mostly water. It's actually kind of a similar composition. And because the planet is mostly water, more than 90% of the habitable living space on the earth is in the ocean. And because of that, and because life uh, evolved from the deep sea or from the ocean, and it's had much more time to evolve, there's a much greater diversity of life in the ocean than there is on land. So the ocean really represents a huge portion of the diversity of life on our planet. So it really is a part of who we are. And then of that great body of water, much of it, uh, more than 63% of it is below is, is the deep sea, basically. It's below where light can penetrate. So a lot of it is a very different world than we experience up here. Um, and the deep sea is largely unexplored. Only 5% has been explored and 15% mapped. So we have so much more to learn about this, this great um, area that has so much to do with our life up here. So the ocean regulates climate, it provides the air that we breathe, a lot of the food that we eat. So every breath that you take, you can feel the connection to the ocean because that's, that's where it's originated, the air and the food and um, how we experience climate. Uh, basically, the, the ocean made life habitable on planet Earth. And so it's so important to understand the deep sea and the ocean in general as a part to think of the world as an integrated global system. We're not separate, but it's all a part of one, one thing. So the deep sea is uh, so unexplored because it's been so hard to get there. Usually you would need huge expensive ships and really high tech equipment like uh, and bulky equipment like a submarine or something like that. And you can only see a very small portion of that area um, with that kind of equipment. And so what we really need is more, more technology to be able to access the ocean and to explore it and understand it. And so, oh, we got a little cut off, but in 2009, the deep sea, um, the Exploration Technology Lab developed a deep sea camera system that's small, it's about the size of a basketball and it's lightweight. And you, it, um, it just makes it, so there's a camera inside of there. Actually here, let me just show you a video 
of the process. So you'll see, so it's a small uh, camera encased in a glass sphere and you program the camera to record for a number of hours and it has a weight that takes it down to the bottom of the ocean. And there it sits while it goes through its programming. So it has lights so that we can see and it's uh, baited, there's bait in a, encased in there so it attracts the predators around that area. When it's done recording, it lifts off to the surface and then we go search for it with um, aided by VHF uh, radio beacons and also the flags to be able to see it. And then we download the video footage and then we can see what lives in the deep sea. So this has really accelerated ocean exploration because of its um, efficiency, basically. And so I wanted to show you guys some example footage of what we might see down there from various places around the world that the cameras have been. So deep sea sharks, we see a lot of the predators in the deep sea. They come from all around because they're attracted by the bait and they come check out the bait some of them try to eat it. And um, so these are, it's an amazing view into what we normally, we wouldn't be able to see without a submarine or big expensive equipment. And so these are just very ancient creatures that we're seeing because um, time moves, seems to move very slowly in the deep sea without the, um, the cycles of the day, everything is very, um, slow moving. So these are ancient creatures. So it's kind of like looking back in time when we peer down into the ocean, into the deep sea. And so if you can imagine this environment, it's dark, always dark, like I said, and the, it's under extreme pressure. This is a chimera, which is a relative of the shark that you only see in the deep sea. Um, so it's under extreme pressure. There's actually the highest mountain ranges and the deepest trenches are in the ocean. So the, the habitat in the ocean is very diverse, but there's such a large expanse of it. So in many areas that might just be vast um, with, with nothing around for a long time. And so these, um, these creatures kind of are roaming around in that dark, deep ocean and kind of looking for food. And um, it's a whole nother world down there. So I just wanted to show you some of the things that we, that we see on the video footage. And so what we do for, with the science is that we download the video footage and then we go through and we have the task of identifying as best we can all the, all the creatures that we see in the video frame. And, um, and so we, we also count how many there are there. So we take the video footage and we identify and count what's there. And then we turn it into a measure of biodiversity. So it's a biodiversity, we turn that into a number. And then with those numbers, we can um, provide the science needed to understand biodiversity and the patterns in biodiversity in the deep sea. And this is what is needed as a baseline in order to inform protection and management for these areas. So this is the first step in protecting the deep ocean. And so these cameras have been all over the world since 2009. And this, what you see here is mostly with pristine seas expeditions um, with National Geographic and Enrique Sala that have gone to these far remote places and documented the amazing life that is here at these places in order to um, set up marine protected areas so that we can um, protect biodiversity there. So they've been all around the world and now we have the task of um, identifying all those creatures and kind of creating a map of, of patterns in biodiversity. So that is our work, as well as with more expeditions. Um, there we go. So um, as far as the art integration, um, 
as I talked about in the beginning, the ocean is, it doesn't just provide number or as, as human beings, we don't just experience numbers of a place. So the scientific process takes that video footage and, and the imagery of, that, of all those amazing species and ecosystems and goes through that process and turns that into a number. And this is what we need to inform management. But as human beings, we experience much more than numbers. We experience qualities when we go to a place. And I think that those qualities like beauty and wholeness and awe and wonder, those qualities are important for being able to express and to share the wonder and how amazing these and why we should protect deep ocean ecosystems. And so to, to get at the kind of qualities of a place to complement the numbers, I developed an, uh, a journaling technique that we can do on our expeditions. And these, it's kind of like going back to the history of, of exploration and, um, and uh, natural history where the um, explorers had these wonderful journals where they would, they would write down um, poems and just um, really paying attention to the different senses and experience that you have while you're out on these ocean places. So in a similar vein, um, this field journaling technique concentrates on ways to really focus on observation and how do we as explorers really pay attention to our observations and observe very carefully. Um, and that includes drawing exercises because drawing can really help you to observe more carefully and to also express um, aspects of the ecosystem and the landscape. And then also with writing exercises. And I found that um, very short haiku poems. So haiku is a tradition, ancient traditional Japanese form of poetry, which really focuses on different senses, sight, smell, taste, um, very simple, usually three line poem to just kind of capture the moment of exploration. And so there's one on our last trip to the Galapagos back um, last year with Lindblad expeditions, we did a, a exploration of seamounts around the Galapagos. And um, one of the naturalists there joined in the journaling exercises and she wrote this wonderful haiku poem that I think really captures that feeling of exploration in the deep sea. So she says, fall deep in the sea, recording dark weird treasures, blast up right on time. And I love that because it really captures that kind of dropping this instrument into the water and, and knowing that it's far below recording, um, you know, seeing all these things, all these weird creatures down there. And then that moment kind of waiting on the surface, are we gonna find the drop cam again when it comes up again? Um, and then just kind of silence and waiting on the surface and then blast up, up it comes. And then we get to download the footage and see what was there. So it really captures that excitement of doing deep sea research that I wanted to share. And so um, this is something that, so we're all, you know, our expeditions are on hold now, but this is a technique that we can do in our own homes and our own backyards is to just um, pay attention to nature. And when you do, you see that the mark of water is everywhere, that the ocean um, is everywhere. We're connected to it through, through water and through nature. And um, one of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver wrote, instructions for living a life, pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. So this very simple instructions that I think are very profound and something that we can do all the time to feel connected to nature um, and to the ocean. And so I invite you for your own explorations in your own homes and around in your own neighborhood to try, try field journaling and really pay attention and most of all, tell about it because I think more, more than ever, we need to feel excited and connected to nature 
um, to be astonished and to tell about it. So that was what I wanted to share for the work that we are doing. And um, so excited to see all of you and I would be happy to take any questions. Amazing, Jonathan, question time is our favorite part of the day. But before we get to that, I just wanna remark that that was amazing. I normally am thinking about the deep sea as such an extreme and kind of hostile place. And your presentation was so peaceful and really let me focus on the beauty and intricacy of deep sea life. I, or of deep sea life, excuse me. It was just really wonderful and I really appreciated it. Thank For folks you. learning along at home, we'd love to know what you appreciated about today. So uh, maybe you do a follow-up activity from our family guide. You draw a picture, make a comic strip, produce a video, write a story, something like that. We would love to see it, whatever it may be. You can send it to us on Twitter by tagging at NatGeoEducation and using the hashtag Explorer Classroom. You can go ahead and tag Jonathan as well. Her information's on screen right now. That way we can make sure that she gets a chance to see all of your cool work. And now it's question time. So exciting. If you're watching along online, start sending your questions in the chat bar for us. We record them all as they come in. So you only need to send each question one time. Please don't spam us. Um, and if you're up here on screen with me, get ready with your nice loud voice. I will let you know when it's your turn. But Jonathan, our first question today comes to us from Yana in St. Louis, who is wondering how much of the deep sea has been explored and what do we consider having been explored. So I think I heard you say something like 5% explored, 15% mapped. Could you break that down a little more for us? Sure, yeah, great question, thank you. So exploration, about 5% has been explored. Um, and by exploration, meaning kind of just going and, and seeing what's there, but it's not quite, we don't mean like a very, um, detailed scientific uh, study in this area. So that that's much, much less. It's like less than way less than 1% to be able to set up a, an experimental design or a real ecosystem, a complete design to be able to um, say, to answer questions in a hypothesis driven way. But exploration being more like, hey, we're here, let's go see what's down there. So that's more of the, um, of the ex about the five percent and then 15 percent mapped meaning with like modern tools so and those are that's all very recent um but there is a plan now that within the next decade the plan is to map in high resolution the entire ocean or you know fill in all the gaps and so even though we have very little of that mapped right now, where there's people who are working on that to be it so that we can, you know, understand really and have good maps of the ocean. So thank you for that question. Super cool. And we've got Sophia, an eighth grader, who is wondering how long you normally send a drop cam down for, and how do you decide the amount of time it's going to stay down? Oh my gosh, that's the that is such a good question. <laughs> and this also goes back to kind of the explored versus scientifically studied. Um, so normally the drop cams, they have um, six hours of recording time uh, because of the battery issue or limitation of the battery with the lights and the camera and stuff. So, but you can um, cycle the camera on and off. So the cameras have been down anywhere from an hour to 12 hours is about the max. But that question of how long do they need to be down is the next thing that we're gonna go do when we're allowed to go back out on the water again, because that's the exact question that we have is, so when you have this um, gradient in depth, the further you go down, the more dispersed the creatures are. So we think that, you know, with each depth zone is going to have a different time to max n is what we call it, because that's what we're counting is max n. So we're going to go out and do experiments in Hawaii about um, like leaving the cameras down for 24 hours and then see how long it takes so that we can really hone in on exactly how long you need to get for your optimum time. So, so far it has varied depending on 
on you know the ship schedule or things like that but we're we're going to focus on figuring out exactly or having better guidance on exactly how much time but so far it's been between an hour to um, 12 hours and it's probably the deeper you go the longer it needs to be there and that's a great question that's what we're working on Amazing. We've got some questions also about sort of the animal's response to the drop cam. Uh, is there an amount of time that they're afraid of it before you start to see them in the in the shot again? What's it yeah. like to have sort of this alien device descend into their world? Yeah, that's super weird, especially so the the cameras, the lights will cycle on and off with the video camera. And so some and all the different species kind of have different behaviors towards that. Some might be attracted to the light. They think it's interesting. Some are afraid. And so, and they disappear. Um, when the, you can see when the lights come on, you see something dart away. You're like, wait, come back. I want to see you. But then it'll, the, um, as it's down there, the lights and the camera will cycle off and then it might come back and then you can see it briefly again. So yeah, the, um, it's different per per organism whether they're attracted or afraid and so that is something that we always have to think about and acknowledge when like writing up like this area has this many species but you always have to remember that some might be darting away it's a it's a bias that you just have to kind of think about but the good news is that we can call it relative abundance um, because where we go around the world, the creatures are gonna, that same species is gonna have the same behavior. So we, we can still compare um, biodiversity with this device because it's always the same bias that it has basically. So it's just, you know, we get the data, but then you have to really think carefully about interpreting it and know the limitations. So of what, you know, what's attracted and what uh, flees. So this is all, you know, super interesting questions. You guys are, you guys are uh, really smart. <laughs> Our audience is kind of the best. Um, let's do yeah. a question from an on-screen group. Let's go to the Weekend Warriors. Your microphone's on. What's your question, guys? How deep can the camera go? Ah, that's another wonderful question. So those ones, the, the pictures uh, that I showed are called the Dropcam Mini. So it's a smaller version and they're rated to about 6,000 meters. Um, a lot of the deployments have been between 200 and 3,000 meters. We don't always go very deep, but the first drop cams that were invented were much bigger and they were invented to go full ocean depth. So all the way down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench to the deepest part of the world. So um, there's, yeah, two versions of them. So one of them full ocean depth, but the ones we use to about 6,000 meters. Yeah, thank you. We've got a related question in the chat bar from Harmony. Really, really cool question. How do scientists know how deep the ocean is, right? Like probably not a ruler. What, what are you guys using to measure? Well, there, you know, at first, the first explorations were using um, like dropping line into the ocean and seeing how, how deep it was that way. But now with the mapping, they use uh, multi, multi-beam, so echo sounders. So it's a measure of the sound that goes down to the bottom and then how it comes back up. So measuring using using sound somehow. I didn't explain that very well about that. <laughs> but it's good sound now. Well, they know about echolocation from our bats episodes. They can go on a, on a Wikipedia tangent. It'll be great. <laughs> we got the picture. And let's yeah. go to Claire for our next question. Claire, your microphone is on. When did you know you wanted to be a marine um, ecologist? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, well, I guess it was sort of in stages because m when I was young, when I met the ocean and I knew how much I loved it and how much it, it means to me, I knew that I wanted that it was gonna, the ocean was 
just so much a part of my life, but I didn't actually, when I was young, I didn't actually know about marine scientists. I didn't know that that existed. <laughs> and so I, I wasn't, I couldn't really say, oh, I wanna be a marine scientist because I didn't know about it. I just knew that I loved the ocean and that my life would have something to do with the ocean. And so this, when I knew I wanted to be a marine scientist was actually in high school when I met one who's, you might know Robert Ballard, a, a National Geographic explorer. And we were so fortunate. I don't know how we were this fortunate, but it was a, a class. I, was, I grew up in Massachusetts, in inland Massachusetts. Um, Robert Ballard came to my high school and gave a talk and um, just listening to him speak about the ocean and and letting you know letting us know that there is so much to explore there's so much unknowns and um that people go out and explore and make discoveries and are really helping to understand the ocean i knew that's what i wanted to do and i was so excited to know about it <laughs> love it we've got Adele um online who's wondering if the drop cams can ever get lost or destroyed they can, yeah. They, um, that's how we find about out about the depth rating. <laughs> so there were some that, um, you know, if it goes too deep or there's like a chip or something's not quite right with the system, it can get imploded by the by all the pressure. So that has happened, and that's helped to, um, you know, really define the depth rating. So we know don't go this deep anymore with that, and then on the surface, um, the drop cam can have an early release. And then once it's on the surface, if you're not there to pick it up, the currents can take it and really fast. And um, so they do have ways to help find it, which is, you know, uh, listening to a VHF radio signal so you can track it down. So we do that. And then also an Argo satellite beacon. And so you can track with GPS where it's gone too. But that is um, something that you have to, when you're doing your plan, your deployment plan, you have to um, take those all into account. So you have to be on this, it can't just pop up without you being there to get it because the ocean will take it all around <laughs> the world. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. We've got Carola who's wondering if there's any DIY or open source versions of, of similar ocean exploration equipment that they could try themselves. Um, yes, so I look into Brendan, um, let me see, Brendan Phillips. I think he has an open source DIY um, he's at the University of Rhode Island, and I did, I read a paper from him recently that was a similar kind of a drop cam, but I think that it did have instructions like how to build it yourself. So yeah, Brennan Phillips at um, University of Rhode Island. Yeah. That sounds like an amazing way to rock your science fair, Carola. <laughs> um, let's grab another question from on screen. Let's go to Sky, a fifth grader. Your microphone is on. Um, what is the most fascinating discovery you have encountered in the ocean? Well, um, the most fascinating discovery, I think finding new, like finding out new aspects about species, biodiver uh, about their ranges. So if we, we go to a place and we think we know about, you know, how far this deep sea shark you know where they live in their depth range and then we go to a new place and we find it where it's not supposed to be or where we didn't know so that has been really an exciting finding to kind of look at the video footage and say wow i've never seen that before and then do all the research and to find out that well they're not supposed to be here you know and then it turns out with the with that video clip then you found a whole new area of that we didn't know about this one species. So I think it's really kind of learning about these species 
life and where they inhabit in the ocean and um, making those discoveries, learning more about the creatures. Speaking of woe, I've never seen that before. Uh, Stephanie and Nitten are both wondering if you've ever found anything new to science using a drop cam. Um, well, the, there's a lot of, there's um, things that are new to me. <laughs> and then and then we can, what we do is when we don't know where, what something is, we send a clip and reach out to different expert taxonomists who might know more than we do. And sometimes they don't know either. And then, and nobody quite really knows. The, um, the thing about the video though, is that it's so hard to actually describe, to really confirm it with, with the video, you really need a sample to be able to describe a new species that's new to science. And so we don't know what we, if we don't know, or we don't know, but we don't know if it's new to science yet. So we need more data basically, but I definitely have found things that are new to me. <laughs> Amazing. We've got so many people who are wondering if you have any pets, Jonathan, I think maybe they're hearing the birds in the background. Yeah. Oh gosh. I hope, sorry that if they're so loud, there's a lot of birds. Um, there are these um, berries that are on the palm trees right now and the, the birds are kind of yapping, but, and then there's wild chickens and roosters around here too. So um, hopefully we don't hear any roosters, but I don't have any pets, but there's lots of wildlife around. <laughs> Love that. And then we've got a great question from Gideon and Susan. They're wondering how long it takes from the surface to the bottom for a drop cam to make that journey. Oh, well, that depends on the depth and it depends on how heavy the, uh, the weight is. So we make these sandbags. And so if it's super heavy, it'll go down. It's about a meter per second. Um, so then we just calculate out the depth, but it can be anywhere from, you know, a couple minutes to five, 10 minutes. And then, so that's, you know, when we put it in, especially on its way up, you know, just calculating, okay, the drop cam stopped recording at this time. It's gonna take either five, 10, 15 minutes. However, depending on the depth, so that's when we know to start looking for the camera, but it's about a meter per second that it travels through the water column. Wow, I've been skydiving and we, we fell for a minute. I can't imagine something falling for, for 10 minutes. That's so far at a meter per second, so neat. Yeah. Um, let's go to a question from Krish, who is wondering what your very favorite part of your job is, Jonathan. Oh gosh, there's so many. <laughs> there's so many parts. I, well, I love talking about the, <laughs> the deep sea and sharing uh, with all of you. And I always get, I love these. I always get some questions that somebody asks and I'm like, oh, I never thought of that. And then it kind of reinvigorates the work. So I love sharing the work. I love being out on the ocean. Um, I love, you know, working with the drop cam. I love, I guess I have to pick a favorite, huh? Uh, I, yeah, I guess it's sharing, being out on the, on the ocean and like really paying attention and, and absorbing all of that and then being able to share that with the world. Rita has an interesting question. You talked a lot about different senses that you use for exploration in your presentation, but you've got this barrier when you're using a drop cam. Do you ever just want to like reach out and touch the animals that you're seeing on the, on the film? Gosh, you know, that's a great question for touch because my background, before I studied the deep sea, I studied coral reef ecosystems and that was based a lot on diving, on scuba, I did a lot of scuba diving for research. And that was always something that, you know, you don't touch anything down there because you don't want to disturb it. So I think I've always kind of stayed away from that touch, um, wanting to touch things. So no, I guess I haven't wanted to reach out and touch it, but I have wanted to, again, maybe, you know, based on the scuba diving, I have wanted to be there with it. Like, I wish I, instead of watching it on a screen, I just want to like be out there and experience what it feels like to, 
you know, the sounds um, and, and the feeling of being underwater. I, I do miss that. And I, I, yeah, that's a really interesting question. It's yeah, how do you bridge that? But I think I do it kind of visually too because I'm used to drawing things. And so I can, I feel like I get a big, the big picture from, from visual. Really cool. We've yeah. got a Hiram who's wondering about underwater volcanoes and hydrothermal vents and other really extreme stuff underwater. Can a drop cam go there or would it be damaged by those really intense environments? Yeah, it would probably, it would be damaged if it went right, you know, onto a hydrothermal vent, but it can be near it, um, which would be a really interesting way to explore those. But um, yeah, it would definitely be careful with, with dropping it around there because it's not exactly precise where, where we drop it, uh, especially if it's a long way down, it can drift here and there. So we'd want to be careful about that. Similarly with um, like a kelp or, or, you know, anywhere that it could get entangled, we would want to be careful with that. Helenga has an interesting question. She's wondering if there are any kids books or websites or anything that really stuck with you as a child that, that you would recommend for our, our, our viewers. Um, no, actually, um, not that I know of now, but I would have to, I think there's a lot more now than there, there was when I was a kid. Um, well, we didn't have the internet <laughs> yet when I was really little. Um, but now, I mean, I was looking through the family guide actually provided here, and there was all that um, information on like Bob, Bob Ballard's work and Sylvia Earle. And yeah, so I would start with that family guide if you haven't seen yet. And that links to a lot of National Geographic's um, videos and, and information. So I would go there, yeah. Amazing. Let's go back to the Weekend Warriors for another question. Your microphone is on, folks. Uh, what is your favorite creature? I love sharks. I love um, all kinds of sharks, um, especially hammerheads, those ones with the crazy um, heads that look like hammers. And uh, I, yeah, the, I just think that they're, they're so interesting and um, intriguing and they're really cool. They're top predators and yeah, so I love, I love sharks. So do our YouTube viewers. There are so many questions in the chat bar about whether or not a shark has ever bitten one of your drop cams. It has, yeah, especially in really, I mean, they love to go after the bait. That's how we get, you know, the creatures to come in close. And so a lot of the video footage is of them like coming up to the camera and, you know, trying to get that bait and they have bitten through the line. We use this natural rope because it's biodegradable, but the sharks can easily fight through that line and in um, sharky places that's happened quite a bit. Um, so they do love, yeah, they're attracted and then they try and eat, eat our bait. So we see very close ups of, of sharks who are, yeah. So oh, cool. What an interesting job, Perk. And then we've got Riley Marriott, who's wondering what happens to all of the footage and, and uh, photos that you guys get back. Do those live somewhere? Could we access those? Yeah, they do. We're actually working on that as part of this whole, like the whole picture of um, the data process. So right now we're working with Ben Woodward with C Vision AI. He's out of, um, out of Boston. And so right at first, all the video footage just lived on different various hard drives and we would kind of send, you know, hard drives over the mail and work on it that way. But now it's all a kind of integrated. We're getting it all uploaded into this platform that it is uh, run with uh, C Vision AI. And that's where we do our annotations from. 
And so right now that's not open access, but we are working on ways that we can um, make it, you know, public facing. So we'll have an, you know, annotated data set, but then also um, be able to, where you could actually go in and like click and look at what's down there too. So that's something that we talk about in our meetings. Okay, how can we do this? So that, that will be coming up because that's something that we definitely want to do. I so love it. We're all going to have to stay tuned. That sounds amazing. Yeah. And Jonathan, as you know, it's Teacher Appreciation Week. Is there a teacher in your life that you'd like to give a shout out to? Yeah, I, um, I always am appreciative of um, Dr. Uh, John Biacco. He was a sociology teacher that I had in high school. And I'm always, always appreciative of that class and that point in my life because he really encouraged um, thinking deeply and differently about about everything and um, and really exploring that, like exploring my own viewpoint and looking at like the history of knowledge and how do we know things. Um, so that was, it was really important for me to stay really engaged and excited in, in science and in learning and in everything um, to be able to explore my own viewpoint and have feel like that it was valid. Um, so I'm always appreciative for, yeah, my high school teacher, John Biacco. Love that. And do you have any general advice for all the young explorers out there? Yes, I generally, I think I would say to um, explore your, what really drives you, what is your passion? What do you really love um, to follow that? So you don't always have to just follow a predefined path like I want to be this so you have to fit into this lane um, I think especially now we need a diversity of viewpoints and a diversity of contributions so if you have a particular passion but it doesn't fit into any like any predefined thing explore that and follow that and and um bring that and know that your your voice and your perspective is needed and it's valuable so keep exploring pay attention and tell about it beautiful thank you well everyone check out explore classroom and many many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org I hope to see you at some of our upcoming events at 2 p.m. Eastern time on Monday. We're going to be exploring tide pools with ichthyologist and explorer Joe Cutler. And for now, I'm going to turn on everybody's microphones nice and loud. Let's say goodbye and thank you as we sign off for today. Ready? Bye. Bye.